guys, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. And if I sound like I have a cold, it's because I do. You probably can't even tell, but to me, I feel like little Chucky Finster. Anyway, this episode is part two of the Woody Allen story. If you haven't heard part one, you're going to want to go back and listen to that one before you listen to part two. Guys, this case is fucking bonkers. Every time I think that I'm done with my research, I open up a whole new rabbit hole. And this is just fucking never-ending. Every time one person says something, somebody else debunks it, and then somebody else comes back and argues that, and it just goes on forever and ever and fucking ever. So once again, I'm going to try to lay down the facts with an unbiased perspective and let you form your own opinions. One of the difficult things about this case is that for every breakthrough, there's a whole other breakthrough that debunks the first one. So if you're not liking the direction this story is headed in, you might want to tough it out anyway because things change from one second to the next. And I'm going to try to get to the bottom of everything, but man, I'm telling you, there is no end to these rabbit holes. So real quick, I just want to reiterate that I do believe Dylan Farrow. It might sound like I'm trashing Mia Farrow here, but in a lot of the evidence I found against Woody Allen, people kept making claims that they were leaving out information about Mia. So in this episode, I did most of my research on the other side. The side that defends Woody Allen. And his side's not pretty, guys. So let's get into it. We're going to talk about Suni first. Suni was found living in the streets of South Korea at about age 6 or 7. She was adopted by Mia Farrow and Andre Previn. And she was about 10 years old when Mia started dating Woody Allen. So when Suni talks about when she first met Woody Allen and when he first started dating Mia, she says that she couldn't stand him. Woody like didn't like kids and he had no interest in meeting any of Mia's kids and they had absolutely no interest in meeting him either. Suni says that she especially hated him because she couldn't understand how someone could be with such a nasty, mean person like Mia Farrow. So she figured that he must have been a terrible person too. So one day in 11th grade, Suni broke her ankle playing soccer, and she says that it was not in her vocabulary to ask Mia for help. So when she got home, Woody took one look at her and was like, you need to go to the doctor. So she goes to the doctor, and when she came back, she had a cast and crutches, and he offered her a ride to school. Around this time, Suni actually overheard Woody telling Mia that she should probably take Suni to a shrink. See, Mia had always pounded it into Woody's head that Suni was a loser. And she was super quiet and introverted, so Woody was like, yeah, maybe you should take that kid to a shrink. And Mia suggested that they hang out together and form a friendship. So Woody and Suni started to go to basketball games together, and Suni says that she could tell the relationship with Mia and Woody wasn't so hot anymore. So her and Woody started to open up to each other a little bit more. Okay, so like I said, Mia says that her and Woody were still together at this point. But Woody kind of describes how around this time, their relationship started falling apart. Ronan had just been born, and according to Woody, Mia was breastfeeding him a lot. Woody called her obsessed with Ronan. So I guess Mia was talking a lot about how all these different cultures breastfeed until age 7 or 8, and Mia talked about how she was going to do that as well. And Woody talks about it like, she was in her bedroom all day and all night breastfeeding Ronan, always with the door locked, just the two of them, and didn't come out for anybody. That's the picture that Woody Allen paints. The way Suni describes it, she says that she actually recalls times where Dylan was like two or three years old and she would be sitting outside of Mia's door crying because Mia was in the bedroom with Ronan. Taking that a bit further, Woody Allen's memoir is called Apropos of Nothing. He says that Mia actually slept naked in bed with Ronan until he was about 11 years old. He says that a babysitter named Sandy had witnessed it a number of times. This is, of course, a lot like Mia's accusation of Woody being obsessed with Dylan. And I'm not even positive which accusation came first. However, a family spokesperson did say that Mia was in her bedroom a lot because she was recovering from a difficult delivery. The thing here is both of these people have a lot of power, a lot of respect, a lot of money. Who's to say they're not paying somebody off for something? I mean, every little fact in this case could have a potential rebuttal. Anyway, Suni and Woody are starting to get closer, and they said it was just as friends at first, like they're just going to basketball games. 
But as they started talking more, they watched a movie together one time and they got into a really interesting conversation about it. And Suni thinks that she must have impressed him because that's when he kissed her for the first time. She describes it as them being totally attracted to each other like a couple of magnets. And I want to say real quick, I'm not trying to romanticize anything, and I don't want to talk about Suni as a victim either. I'm just presenting the facts that I could find. So they both thought that it would be just a fling, but apparently it was the whole molestation charge that threw them together. This is a quote from Woody Allen. He said, Our relationship deepened as we went through the barrage of terrible accusations, and the paparazzi forced us to take walks only on my penthouse roof. So after Mia found the new pictures of Suni, this was in January of 92, according to Suni, Mia called her and told her she had the pictures. And instead of trying to contain the situation, Mia told absolutely everyone. And then Woody came over and she screamed at him. Suni says that Mia would lose her shit and scream in the middle of the night while Dylan and Ronan were only like six and four years old. And Mia would scream for hours while they were sleeping, according to Suni. But to Mia's defense, I am guessing that situation wasn't really easy to get over. And then imagine trying to tell your little kids, hey, um, your sister, she's daddy's girlfriend now. Not me, but your sister. Your sister is daddy's girlfriend now. But Woody was baffled over the backlash. He really didn't think Mia would take it so badly. So, supposedly, Woody broke down and asked Mia to marry him. He actually said that the affair was probably good for Suni's self-esteem. Can you imagine? I was helping. I did a good thing. Everything's fine. And then I guess Mia slapped him. So Mia kicked Suni out of the house, and Suni started staying over with a friend named Alexis. And she kind of wanted to come back home because she didn't know what was going on. She was completely out of the loop with Woody and the kids, and she just had no idea what was happening. So she wanted to get back so she could just understand the situation. So she came back home at some point, and she overheard Mia on the phone with Woody, and she was saying things like, Suni regrets everything, and she's threatening to commit suicide. And Suni says that wasn't true. However, a family spokesperson says that she was indeed talking about suicide. But talking about suicide, what does that mean? I mean, was she saying something like, oh, I can't be here for another minute, I'm going to kill myself, you know, or was she serious? Either way, Suni says she was not suicidal. But she was starting to get paranoid because they had a neighbor who was a psychologist, and he suggested that Suni go and get a shrink. And she was paranoid that Mia was brainwashing him. So apparently the same psychologist who's a neighbor told Woody that he should put some money away from Suni to go to college because Mia and Andre were threatening to cut her off financially. In fact, Andre did end up cutting her off altogether, and he also said that she's no longer a daughter to him. There was talk that Mia had hired somebody to follow Suni, so she was constantly nervous. But one day she saw a payphone and she called Woody and she said, Don't worry, I'm not suicidal. I don't regret anything. And whatever you need to do, I understand. She says that she knew he had a lot to handle, and the last thing he needed to do was worry about her. Now, remember in part one when I talked about a creepy valentine that Mia sent to Woody? Where she stabbed skewers through the hearts of the kids? Well, around that same time, Mia apparently called Woody's sister. Her name is Letty. And Mia told Letty, he took my daughter. I'm going to take his. Then Letty said, don't be ridiculous. Dylan loves Woody. A child should have a father. And Mia said, I don't care. Now again, this is according to Letty. So in June of 92, Mia sent Suni to work at a summer camp. Suni was getting constant phone calls from a guy named Mr. Simon, who ended up being Woody. And I'm saying he bombarded her with phone calls. And she ended up getting fired because of this. And when she got fired, she went back to live with her friend Alexis. So Mia thinks that Suni is still working at summer camp. She has no idea that her and Woody are still talking. And the way she found out was she saw paparazzi photos of Suni outside of Woody's apartment. So remember, this happened sometime between June and July of 92. On August 1st, Mia calls Dr. Coates and tells her that Woody is satanic and evil, and they have to find a way to stop him. Then, just a couple days later, on August 4th, that's the day when Woody supposedly molested Dylan. 
Okay, I think at this point you might see how Mia is now being painted in a darker light. Aside from claiming that Mia had it out for Woody and was lying because she was upset about his relationship with Suni, claims were also being made that Mia was abusive. If you recall, and in part one, nanny Monica Thompson claims to have witnessed Mia slapping Moses and treating her biological children better than her adoptive children. Suni actually made this exact same claim. As Suni puts it, her and her adopted sisters were treated like domestic workers. She says that they were responsible for grocery shopping, cooking, cleaning the bathrooms, ironing Mia's sheets. Suni says that Mia also left her completely to her own devices, never taught her how to put on makeup or use a tampon, and she says that her very first bra was actually given to her from a babysitter. According to her friend Alexis, it was actually Alexis's mom who took Suni to tour colleges. She says that Mia was physically abusive towards her, saying that Mia slapped her across the face, hit her with a hairbrush, called her stupid and moronic. She says that she can't even think of a single good memory of Mia Farrow. Now, if you ask her brother Moses Farrow, his account isn't any better. Moses says that Mia was abusive and would also brainwash the kids. In 1992, he read a letter publicly denouncing Woody and later stated that that was the biggest regret of his life. The way he puts it, Mia had a way of breaking your spirit to get you to do exactly what she wanted. He describes how she would make him repeat phrases over and over again, kind of like rehearsing, and then she would smack him when he didn't say exactly what she wanted. Like she would make him admit to things he didn't do, like moving a tape measure. She asked him where the tape measure was and he kept telling her he didn't know, and basically she kept smacking him until he finally said, okay, I moved the tape measure. On another occasion, Moses says that he cut the belt loops off of some jeans because he thought it would look cool, and Mia lost her shit. She apparently took away all his clothes and told him he didn't deserve them, and she made him stand in a corner in her bedroom and let his siblings come in and look at him. Moses also denies the allegations that Dylan has made against Woody, saying that he was home before, during, and after the alleged assault. Moses is now a family therapist and has written essays on this case. He's got this big old blog that talks all about it if you want to look it up. But if you ask any of Mia's children other than Suni or Moses, they'll all disagree. In HBO's Alan V. Farrow, they interviewed Moses, Sasha, Fletcher, Matthew, and Matthew's old girlfriend, as well as Dylan, of course. They were all specifically asked about the abuse that Moses and Suni have described, and they all deny it. There's one more big claim that people make against Mia and I don't want to be accused of intentionally omitting it, Mia actually had three children who have passed away. Lark, Tam, and Thaddeus. Two of the three deaths were possible suicides, and a lot of people speculate that this might have been a result of Mia's alleged abuse towards her adopted kids. Thaddeus passed away in 2016. He shot himself in his car ten minutes away from Mia's house. I should mention... Thaddeus has expressed his gratitude towards Mia, and the only mention I could find of any possibility of Mia being the reason for his suicide is Moses' word. I could not find any indication that Thaddeus was suicidal because of his mother. The other possible suicide was Tam, who died in 2000. So, I'm going to read off a statement from Moses' blog. Most media sources claim my sister Tam died of heart failure at the age of 21. In fact, Tam struggled with depression for much of her life, a situation exacerbated by my mother refusing to get her help, insisting that Tam was just, quote, moody. One afternoon in 2000, after one final fight with Mia, which ended with my mother leaving the house, Tam committed suicide by overdosing on pills. My mother would tell others that the drug overdose was accidental, saying that Tam, who was blind, didn't know which pills she was taking but Tam had both an ironclad memory and sense of spatial recognition, and of course, blindness didn't impair her ability to count. The details of Tam's overdose and the fight with Mia that precipitated it were relayed directly to me by my brother Thaddeus, a first-hand witness. And now, as we know, Thaddeus is not around to corroborate. Okay, so I know I'm all over the place with this, but there's a lot to cover. So, for the sake of keeping the chronology... Let's go back to the day of August 4th, 1992, the day of the alleged assault. 
In part one, I played a clip of seven-year-old Dylan telling Mia about the assault. Now I'm going to play a clip of Dylan Farrow as an adult explaining what allegedly happened in the attic. I uh, was taken to a small attic crawl space in uh, my mother's uh, country house in Connecticut um, by my father. He instructed me to lay down on my stomach and play with my brother's toy train that was set up. And uh, he sat behind me in the doorway. And as I played with the toy train, I was sexually assaulted. As a seven-year-old, I would say, I would have said he touched my private parts. As a 32-year-old, he touched my labia mm-hmm. and my vulva with his finger. So, let's think about this. Dylan says that Woody touched her labia and her vulva, but investigators say that there was no evidence of assault. Now, I want to point out, this is just my opinion, and I am no expert by any means. Literally, I just watch a lot of Criminal Minds. If Woody just used his fingers to touch her labia and her vulva, which are external, why would there be any physical evidence? I mean, again, from a forensic standpoint, he wouldn't have left any DNA, and her hymen would still be intact if he wasn't in her vagina. I just think it's worth mentioning because it's possible for someone to be sexually assaulted and there be no physical proof of it. And she's seven years old. How is she supposed to provide that burden of proof? It's impossible for her to defend herself regardless. So what does Woody Allen have to say about these allegations? Be, be logical about this. I'm, I'm 57. Isn't it illogical that I'm going to, at the height of a, a very bitter, acrimonious custody fight, drive up to Connecticut where nobody likes me in the house. I'm, I'm with a house full of enemies. I mean, Mia was so enraged at me and, and she had gotten all the kids to, to be angry at me that I'm going to drive up there and suddenly, on visitation, pick this moment in my life to become a child molester. It's just, it's just incredible. I could, if I wanted to be a child molester, I had many opportunities in the past. I could have quietly made a, a, a custody settlement with Mia in some way and done it in the future. I mean, you know, it's so insane. I have to say, it kills me that his best defense is that if he wanted to be a child molester, he would have done a better job. Him and his dedicated fans insist that he's never been accused of being a sexual predator before the alleged attic incident, and they believe that that proves Woody is innocent. So this actually was also covered in Alan B. Farrow. They interviewed a world-renowned expert on sexual predators named Anna Salter, And she explains that it's really not uncommon for a predator to become enamored and obsessed with one single child. As she explains, they feel that the child is their soulmate and sometimes begin with sort of a parental stalking where they're just in the child's face all the time and constantly want to be around them. Which, hello, sounds familiar, right? So she also goes on to say that a lot of times the thrill is in the risk of being caught. So when Woody says that it would be stupid of him to go to Mia's house and molest Dylan at a time when the house is full of people who hate him and were supposed to forbid him from being alone with Dylan. But again, from a psychological standpoint, sexual predators aren't exactly logical all the time. And this kind of thing becomes an obsession. And if Woody Allen really, really was obsessing over being alone with Dylan, what other choice would he have? He can't just pick her up and take her to his house to be alone with him. The other thing that Woody's side constantly argues is that Mia Farrow coached Dylan into telling her story. When Mia got the recording of Dylan talking about the molestation, Woody argued, why did Mia even happen to have a camera out when Dylan started talking? But everyone around said that Mia was constantly recording the kids, saving every memory. The other reason people believe that Mia coached Dylan is because of the nanny, Monica Thompson. I mentioned Monica Thompson. She claimed that she saw Mia following Dylan around with the camera for two or three days, asking her to repeat the story. I'll talk about her more in a second, but I want to stay on Woody for a minute. So we know the crimes that he's been accused of publicly. Turns out that, not unlike Mia, he had also been accused of abusive behavior by other family members. Mia says that when Ronan was about three years old, Ronan kicked Woody, and Woody twisted his leg and threatened to break it, until Ronan screamed so loud and Mia pulled him off of him. She also says that one time Woody pushed Dylan's face into a plate of spaghetti. 
Tisa Farrell, who is Mia's sister, has talked about how the family was having a beach day once, and when he was putting sunblock on Dylan, his hand went down her butt and just kind of lingered there. So Mia snatched the sunblock away and finished putting it on Dylan. What I think is interesting about that is, wouldn't most kids react to something like that? I mean, if Dylan didn't react to him putting his hand there, you have to wonder if she had already been groomed for a while at this point. And at the same time, it's strange that Mia still let Woody adopt Dylan after all this. So Monica. Monica also said that Mia had been setting the stage for weeks up to the allegation. Okay, so remember, Mia found out about Woody and Suni in January of 92, and Dylan's allegation came out in August. In July, it was Dylan's birthday party, and Mia wrote a note and left it on Woody's bathroom door. It said, Child molester at birthday party. Molded then abused one sister. Now focused on the youngest sister. Family disgusted. And this is weeks before Dylan was supposedly molested. It's weird, right? I mean, I guess it's possible that Mia was just suspecting that something could potentially happen. But I still don't understand why she still let Woody come over at this point. The other strange thing that Woody constantly mentions is that he just adopted Dylan and Moses in December of 91. And Mia wrote him a glowing recommendation. This was in her affidavit from the Supreme Court documents. Mia Farrell wrote, Far more of a father than most natural fathers are or choose to be. He is a loving, caring, attentive parent to Dylan, and she can only benefit from having him as an adoptive father. He has acted as Dylan's father almost since her birth and adoption by me. He is present with us during nearly all of Dylan's waking hours. You and I have to admit that's pretty weird. It's possible that she had no concern about Woody being a predator until January 92 when she found the pictures of Suni. But she has repeatedly stated that she's been worried about Woody's behavior towards Dylan since she was two or three years old. So that part's unclear. I also want to say one thing before I move on, just to put things in perspective. Woody adopted Dylan and Moses in December of 91, and by January of 92, just a month later, Mia found the nude pictures of Suni. So I have to wonder, while he was adopting Moses and Dylan, was he already, like, dating Suni? I mean, they claim that they were only hooking up for two weeks before Mia found those photos, but you have to still imagine if this was the time when they're like going to basketball games together and watching movies and giggling together while Woody is about to adopt her little brother and sister. That's weird, right? How does she not think about it while it's happening? Like, I'm going to go to my brother and sister's adoption hearing and then I'm going to go fuck their dad. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk about Dr. Susan Coates for a minute. Remember, she was the family psychologist. So, firstly, Dr. Coates was hired to treat Dylan, not Woody. Mia was concerned about how close Dylan and Woody were, and according to Dr. Coates, she said, I did not see it as sexual, but I saw it as inappropriately intense because it excluded everybody else and placed a demand on a child for a kind of acknowledgement that I felt should not be placed on a child. And she advised Woody to stop giving Dylan excessive amounts of attention. Dr. Coates also testified, Mr. Allen focused on Dylan because he felt Miss Farrell was obsessed with Ronan. So for the sake of accuracy, I need to clear up the whole situation about Woody seeing a psychiatrist. So Woody Allen had been seeing a psychiatrist named Catherine Prescott for 21 years by the time the custody battle took place. And she says that she's never had any inclination to believe that Woody Allen was a sexual deviant in any way. He was never even ordered to go into therapy. It was just something that he had always done to take care of himself. So when people say that he was in therapy because of what was going on with Dylan, that's not exactly true. He was just already going to therapy, and then Dylan started going to therapy. But from what I could find, it turns out that this is not the first time Woody's dated a young woman. Woody dated a girl named Stacy Nelkin, who was 16 when they were dating, and he was middle-aged. She was still in high school. Oddly enough, Stacy continues to defend Woody Allen and believes that Dylan made her story up. She also says that she liked Woody because she was kind of looking for a father figure, and she thinks that that's probably what Suni was looking for, too. However, there is another girl who dated Woody Allen, and her name is Christina Englehart. She was also 16 while dating Woody Allen. They engaged in an eight-year affair right before Woody and Mia started dating. 
in an interview, Christina has been asked, is it possible for you to have been in a consensual relationship with him, you being 16 and him being 40-something? And she says no. So you see, there's two different women who, as young girls, dated Woody Allen, who was a middle-aged man, and they have separate perspectives. But what's funny is, when you watch the interviews with Stacey Nelkin, she sounds like she's still absolutely swooning over him. But once again, what do I know? So going back to the theme of father figures, Woody once described how him and Suni actually really enjoy their 35-year age difference, and he went on to say that he was kind of paternal to her, and she responded to somebody paternal. I can't be the only one who sees the irony here. They claim over and over again that Woody was not a father figure to her, but as her spouse, he's paternal? Okay. Okay, so if I'm going to mention all of Woody's romantic history, I think it's only fair that I talk about Mia's a little bit. It's just kind of interesting because it seems like Mia also has a thing for older men. When she was married to Frank Sinatra, she was 21 and he was 50. And when she was with Andre Previn, she was 25 while he was 41. So, so far, Woody Allen and Mia Farrow both have pretty questionable credibility. And in a situation like this where, like I said, both are highly respected people with money and power, I have to wonder if people are being paid off or manipulated in this case on either side. So with Dylan's case, realistically, only two people really know what happened on August 4th, 1992 in that attic, and that's Woody and Dylan. In any normal circumstance, would the predator ever admit to his crime? Probably not. Is it impossible for Dylan to have made the story up? No, it's absolutely possible. But if we consider the very possible possibility that Woody carefully molested Dylan so as to not leave a trace, how could we possibly expect seven-year-old Dylan to defend herself? How can we put that burden on her? With Suni's case, I think the real question is whether or not Suni was groomed or manipulated into the relationship with Woody. So let's just take a step back for a minute. Remember Suni's upbringing? She was found living in the streets up to age six or seven and eating out of garbage cans. She had learning disabilities and spoke no real language. Then she gets adopted by me and Andre. Andre leaves. Woody comes in. So she just got adopted around age eight. And at nine, her parents are already splitting up and her dad's out of the picture. Her mom quickly brings in a new man into the picture. I can imagine these first few years in the Farrah home being really confusing and Suni probably had a hard time understanding the family dynamic. Then comes Woody Allen, and then in 1985, Dylan was born and adopted by Mia Farrow. So again, just for perspective, Suni is 15 years old, and she gets this new baby sister. And baby sister's dad starts coming around all the time to hang out with baby sister. Then a couple years later, in 87, she gets a new baby brother, Ronan, who is Woody's son, as far as we know. I'll get into that later. But as far as anybody knows, Ronan is the baby of Mia and Woody. So at this point, Suni is now 17. She's seen her mom have two babies with this guy. And that just makes things fuzzy for me. She's watching these babies be born and Woody supposedly be really, really close with Dylan, whether inappropriate or not. But how did it not give her this feeling of, that's my sister's dad? However, Suni is not the adult in this situation. Not at this point anyway. So supposedly Woody and Suni started hanging out when she was about 18 or 19. And you know what this reminds me of? So if you listen to my episode about Mackenzie Phillips, there's a little story I didn't mention in there, but it's from her memoir, where she used to grow up seeing Mick Jagger at all the parties, and she thought he was so hot, but she was just this little kid. And apparently when she was 18, her and Mick Jagger had sex, and he told her, I've been waiting for this since you were 10 years old. That's fucking weird, right? So this is why I just can't get over Woody and Suni. Even if he didn't touch Dylan, Woody has known this woman since she was a child, who is adopted and foreign and gets adopted by this glamorous movie star, and now she's 19 years old getting the attention of Woody fucking Allen during the prime of his career. And she does say that she has no interest in his movies, that she doesn't even like them, but he's still Woody fucking Allen and everybody knows who he is, and I would not doubt that she was flattered by his attention. And let's not forget that Suni spent her childhood homeless and alone, and that her very first father was gone within a year. Isn't it possible that she has abandonment issues? 
And isn't vulnerability something that predators seek out? Again, I'm not an expert. I just watch a lot of Criminal Minds and I listen to the morbid podcast and Bailey Sarian and shit like that. And Suni actually majored in psychology, so she's probably thought about that already. But I wonder what she would say about it, you know? I'm going to read a quote from Suni. She says, I know this is no justification, but Mia was never kind to me, never civil. And here was a chance for someone showing me affection and being nice to me. So, of course, I was thrilled and ran for it. I'd be a moron, an idiot. I wasn't the one who went after Woody. Where would I get the nerve? He pursued me. That's why the relationship has worked. I felt valued. It's quite flattering for me. He's usually a meek person. And he took a big leap. Wow, crazy how he showed up to show her attention. So now that Woody and Suni have been together for nearly 30 years and have kids together and everything, Woody basically says things like, I've been able to make her life better. I've provided her with enormous opportunities. She has sparked to them. She is educated. She went to graduate school, traveled all over. She's sophisticated now. She's a different person. The contributions I've made to her life have given me more pleasure than all of my films. Doesn't that sound groomy as fuck? Okay, guys, I know this episode is all over the place, but I hope you liked it anyway. I know there were a lot of ugly things said and done in this case. I just really wanted to present you with every single side and not my own opinion. To tell you the truth, I, I really don't know how anybody can listen to that recording of Dylan and think she's lying. But anyway, before I finish this up, I want to mention there are a lot of celebrities who have publicly denounced Woody Allen and a lot of them still publicly defend him. First, I'm going to tell you who still defends him. Ready? Scarlett Johansson, Selena Gomez, Blake Lively, Kristen Stewart, Diane Keaton. Oh, especially Diane Keaton. Kate Blanchett. Emma Stone. Miley Cyrus. Alec Baldwin. Barbara Walters. Wallace Shawn. Jeff Goldblum. Jesse Eisenberg. Justin Timberlake. And also, Kate Winslet did defend him, but she totally changed her mind. And she now says, what the fuck was I doing working with people like Woody Allen and Roman Polanski? If you don't know about Roman Polanski, don't worry, I will cover him someday. He was convicted of raping a 13-year-old girl, and a lot of actors continue to work with him. Ironically, Mia Farrow is one of Polanski's biggest supporters and continues to defend him. She says he is one of her closest friends. So there's that. And there are a handful of people who have publicly denounced working with Woody Allen, like Natalie Portman, Rebecca Hall, Elliot Page, and Griffin Newman. Nowadays, Woody says that he does think that Dylan believes what she's saying, though the events she describes never happen. He says that he would like to get back in touch with Dylan if she would ever allow it. In 2019, Woody Allen sued Amazon. They had a deal for four films, and Amazon pulled out of it. Here's why. A few weeks before they backed out, Woody had expressed sympathy over Harvey Weinstein and the accusations of sexual assault against him. Then, in an interview, Woody Allen said that he should be the poster boy for the Me Too movement since he had worked with hundreds of actresses and was only accused by one woman in a child custody case. So, in the end, Amazon backed out and Woody sued them and they settled for $68 million. With the Me Too movement shedding more light on Woody Allen, Woody claims that Dylan is using the movement to her advantage. There's one more little detail that I wanted to include and it may be irrelevant but I thought you might find it interesting. Mia had a brother named John Charles Villiers Faro, who was sentenced to 25 years in prison for child molestation. He abused two little boys, one from the ages of 9 to 16, and the other from the ages of 8 to 13. He entered an Alford plea, which means he didn't admit guilt, but he conceded that there was enough evidence for conviction. He did, however, apologize to the victims at his sentencing. Mia has never commented on this. This could have nothing to do with anything, but Woody has implied in the past that maybe Mia flew into her rages and had an obsession with the theme of child molestation because perhaps Mia's father and brothers were abusive. Again, this is just Woody's word. Before I wrap this up, I'm going to give my one and final opinion, and that is, I would rather believe Dylan Farrow and be wrong than believe Woody Allen and be wrong. And that's all I'm going to say. 
Alright guys, I hope I didn't leave anything out. I am telling you, I could not stop finding shit to add in here. I know this case is controversial as fuck, so if you have any questions you'd like clear up, or if you have more information that I neglected to include, or anything I reported incorrectly, please feel free to reach out to me, and I don't know, maybe I'll make a mini episode with an update. You can always find me on facebook.com slash ddwestlv, and you can find Broken Limelight on YouTube and comment on my videos, and I do check them and respond to them. Again, if you'd like to send me a little donation, you can do that at buymeacoffee.com slash ddwes. And if you like today's episode, please share it with your friends. It would mean the world to me if you could help me get my podcast out. You can also leave me a review on whatever app you're streaming this on, like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So feel free to leave me one if you feel so inclined. Thanks again for listening and for toughing it out on this Woody Allen ride. See you next time. Bye-bye.